our study of Romans. So um, we're in Romans chapter 3 tonight, and uh, we left off last week in uh, verse 20. And I uh, just want to remind you that as we go through the book of Romans, you know, the book of Romans breaks into uh, three main sections, and we're in the first section, which is chapters 1 through 8. And it's really focused in on God's plan of salvation, or we can say justification by faith. And we need to really see what God did for us in sending Jesus to die on the cross. Um, the second section of the book of Romans is chapters 9 through 11, which talks about um, God's plan for the nation of Israel and, and really shows his sovereignty in that, uh, which is really very powerful. And then the last section is chapters uh, 12 through 16, which talks about practical application, how we should live knowing these truths. And uh, last week we left off in verse 20, like I said, and we were really looking at the idea of depravity and, you know, what uh, a lot of theologians will refer to as total depravity in verses 10 through 18, describing the state of man in their sinful nature and describes them as being um, unrighteous, not understanding, not seeking after God, not doing good. Uh, it's, it's really quite, quite a heavy picture of mankind, um, especially prior to coming to Jesus. Uh, very bleak, and we refer to that as total depravity. Um, we'll talk more about that as we get farther on. Uh, but then he also, we also talked about the law of God and why God gave us his law. He actually lays out the purpose of the law in verses 19 and 20, which he states, that the, the law was given that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Um, the purpose of the law is not to bring about righteousness in people. The purpose of the law is to cause us to see our sins and our failures and then hopefully our need for the Savior, right? And so what he does is he transitions from talking about the law into saying how we have achieved, we have attained uh, righteousness that only comes from God and is not by the law because the law can't bring righteousness, right? And so that's what we pick up here today. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 26 and uh, kind of a shorter section, but I'll read it here if you guys want to follow along up on the screen and, and then I'll go through, it, go through it verse by verse. So starting off, uh, Romans chapter 3, starting verse 21, it says this, But now the righteousness of God Apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All right, so we're, we're talking here basically, I mean, this is where we finally get to the good news of Jesus Christ in the message of Romans. Romans starts off in chapter 1, it's so bleak, talking about those who suppress the truth, and God gives them over to their sin, and we see it three times, multiplying the sin in their lives to the point where they are ultimately lost, right? And then chapter 2 talks about the religious person who thinks that they're righteous, but they're not, and they're looking down and judging other people as if they were better than other people, and, and that's not true at all. Um, and then the end of chapter 2 talks about the Jewish people. And in chapter 3, it continues that, and it goes into, is there an advantage of being Jewish? You know, And he says, no, there's no advantage of being Jewish, except for that you have the oracles of God. There is that advantage, but you're not any better than anyone else. And so then it goes into the whole idea of total depravity. And so it's just darkness all through the first two and a half chapters, and then we get to verse 21. And this is where things start to pick up, and this is where the... the letter to the Romans becomes this powerful letter that is perhaps the most important historical document, one of the most historical important <laughs> historical documents in all antiquity. I mean, this, this thing is just to be cherished by Christians, right? So, verse 21, we pick up here, and he says this, 
But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So as we go through, he was talking about the purpose of the law, but he says now the righteousness apart from the law is being revealed. Now it's been revealed. The, the righteousness apart from the law has nothing to do with the law. Why? Because the law only helps us to see our own sin so that we have this clear and exact knowledge of what our sin is. So then we have to have righteousness apart from it because it doesn't give you any righteousness. So he says this righteousness now, apart from the law, is revealed. Okay? The word revealed talks about an act of divine revelation. It means to uh, reveal or to uncover something that was previously hidden. So God is revealing to his people that there is righteousness apart from the law. Now this is revelation, this really is, for the people of God in the Old Testament. Because as they're going through the Old Testament, they're thinking, we're Abraham's descendants. We have the law of God. We are God's chosen people. We have everything we need. And God says, no, 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 I'm going to show you a different righteousness. A righteousness that doesn't come through the law. And for these guys, it's, it's mind-blowing because all of a sudden they're saying, wait, wait, I don't get righteous by following the law? That, that's not how it works? They say, no, that's not it's how it works. Low. It's revealed apart from the law. Like volume. Apart from the law. Um, and this is so, so important. That Bob's been able to turn it up. Uh, he says also, at the end of that, uh, verse 21, he says, it's being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So he says, it's apart from the law, but it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, the word witnessed Showing means to bear witness, here, to testify about something. Here. So, basically, what they're saying is that the law and the prophets, which were the two main parts of the Hebrew Bible, right? You have the law, which are the first five books, and then you have the prophets, which are most a part of and most of the remainder of the Old Testament. And he says these guys are testifying about the righteousness of God. And you say, well, where does that happen? Well, there's all sorts of verses that talk about it. It's, it's foreshadowing the coming of Messiah and the righteousness that he will give to us. Now, I'm going to give you just two examples. And these two are actually verses that we, we have seen and will see in the book of Romans. So, look at uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Here's what it says. Talking about Father Abraham, it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, this is when God appears to Abraham and tells him all sorts of amazing promises and tells him that his descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky. And Abraham believes God. He says, well, if God said it, then that's what's going to happen. Now, this, for a man back then that had no descendants, that was 90-something years old, and it's like, man, I, how am I going to have any descendants? Well, God said it, so I'm going to believe it. And when he believed, he put his faith in, in God at that moment. God counted it to him as righteousness. God counted it to him as righteousness. So this is kind of like having money that's placed into your account. I think I might have used this illustration already. But if someone says, hey, you know, I'm going to pay you for this job. You come to my house, work on my house, do this thing, we'll pay you X amount. And then they just put it in your account. And you're like, well, I haven't even done it yet. It's like, it's okay. I put it in your account. It's good. You know? So they've transferred it to your account even though you haven't done any of the things that are necessary to complete the job. That's what he's saying here. Abraham did nothing to make himself righteous. He, he wasn't able to follow the law. In fact, the law didn't even exist at that time. And he's going through trying to be a good person. But he's a sinner just like us. He's a sinner just like all the other people in the Bible. And so he can't be righteous on his own. But God declared him to be righteous because he believed in what God said. So that's putting his faith in God. So God says, hey, you're going to have an amazing number of descendants. It's going to be like the stars in the sky. And he says, all right, do it. Right? And that simple faith is what gave him his righteousness. Nothing to do with the law. Okay? Now this is obviously foreshadowing for us that we would put our faith in Jesus and that we would have our sins forgiven because we trusted him and said, yeah, he died for me. Yes, I believe in that. And he says, okay, I'm going to declare you righteous as well. I'm going to count righteousness towards you. Okay, So this is an awesome illustration. Now, there's one more example, which is Habakkuk 2.4. 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 Hab
Habakkuk 2 4, we saw in chapter 1, which is a really profound verse. Uh, but this is what it says it says, The just shall live by faith. Okay? The just shall live by faith. Now remember, we have that difficulty in English because we don't have the right verbiage in order to explain this simply. We have righteousness and we have justice. And so when we call someone who is righteous just, but righteousness and justice are not the same thing, you know? And so that gets complicated. And we have no verb to make righteous. So what we end up putting in there is justify or justification, right? And so then that ends up making it kind of confusing because you're saying, oh, wait, am I justified or am I declared righteous? What is it? Yes, it's the same. It's the exact same word in the Greek. The English is just limited. Uh, it's just... Uh, limited because of our the simplicity of our language. English is actually a very simplistic language, which is um, one of the reasons why it's so easy for people to speak it all around the world. Uh, they pick this up and they're able to, to use it because it is a very simplistic language. Um, our conjugations, our verb tenses, and all this kind of stuff, it's, it's very simple, right? So sometimes those limitations end up causing us problems in the translations, right? In Portuguese, it works perfectly. It makes total sense because they have the verb for righteous, and they have a verb, I'm sorry, they have a word for righteous, and then they have a verb to make righteous, and it's the same, it's the same thing, so it's very clear. In, in English, it was always very confusing to me. Why do we, so are we just, are we righteous? What, what does that mean? It's the same thing, right? So, what's he saying? The just shall live by faith. He's saying, the righteous person lives by faith. It's by faith that they are righteous, and that's the way they live their life, following after faith. That's what Abraham did, right? Abraham came through, and he believed in God, followed his faith in what God said, and said, well, God said it, so it's going to happen. That's as simple as it is. And he was declared righteous. So it's the same thing with us. The just shall live by faith. Now, this was given well, with Abraham thousands of years before Jesus. Um, with Habakkuk, it was hundreds of years before Jesus. And so there's foreshadowing that the Old Testament, both the law in Genesis and the prophets in Habakkuk, declared that this would be the way that God would work. That he would declare people righteous by their faith. Now these are just two verses. We could have done a whole study on this and just gone through all the verses in the Old Testament. Um, so this is this is something that we're just scratching the surface here, but I hopefully, hopefully it's clear with these two verses. The Old Testament talks about this. It talks about how there will be a righteousness apart from the law. Okay? So, very, very important. Okay, now, back in the passage. In Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 22. It says this as he talks about this righteousness. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. And then it keeps going away. That last part, for there is no difference, should probably be in verse 23. Remember when this was written? There were no verses. There were no chapter breaks. That was all added in hundreds of years later. And in general, the people who divvied up the the chapters and the verses did an amazing job, like amazing. But every now and then you get some stuff, you're like, well, why didn't you break up that sentence? And why wouldn't you just put the first part of that sentence in the next verse? Um, I don't know. So anyway, he says that the righteousness that is apart from the law is the righteousness of God, which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? This is what we're talking about. So Jesus comes. He dies on the cross for our sins. And then he rises again from the dead to be witnessed by certain disciples in certain moments after his death, right? And then this message is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. And so then we come in hundreds of years later, and we hear the good news about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, him rising from the dead to prove that his death was truly for our sins, that he has the power over death. And then he says, you can be declared righteous by putting your faith in this. This is how simple it is. Now, we look at that and we go, no, that can't be. Because that, that's too easy, right? So all I have to do is believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again? Yeah, that's it. That's the good news. Because in the Old Testament, it was a works-based system. So in this works-based system, they're going through and they're trying to keep all the law. And they're trying to avoid all these dietary problems. And they're trying to make all the right sacrifices at all the right feasts at all the right moments. And it, it's tiring. Because every time you're sitting there, you're doing another sacrifice, another sacrifice, another sacrifice. How many sacrifices do we have to make? And, and God says, yes, exactly. I'll make one more sacrifice for all time 
And all you have to do is place your faith in that sacrifice, kind of like they did in the Old Testament sacrifices. Because these guys would come in, and they'd bring in a lamb, and they'd get it checked out. It's got to be without blemish, without spot. And they'd kill it, right? And they you know, kind of cut it up, and they put portions of it on the altar to make this sacrifice to God. And then what they're saying is, okay, whew, now I'm good. Because now my sacrifice has been made. It's up on the altar for God. Great. But they only go so far until they sit again, which might be minutes. It might be hours. It might be a day. But they're going to sit again real quick afterwards. And then what? Well, then you got to make another sacrifice. I mean, if you're really following what it says, you got to make another sacrifice. And so these guys, they felt the power of that sacrifice. Okay, now I'm good. But it wasn't lasting. With Jesus, it's the same thing. We look at it and we say, okay, I'm putting my faith in his sacrifice, saying, okay, that takes away my sin. Now I'm good. But his sacrifice is once for all time. And so then we don't have to do another sacrifice, and he doesn't have to make another sacrifice. He just did it once for everyone, for the sins of all the world. And uh, we'll talk about that again later on. So um, he says that this righteousness is of God, not of us. And he says it is through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Okay? It's to all and on all who believe. So we receive this righteousness if we believe in the message of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, it's important that we note at the very beginning, he says, it's the righteousness of God. Okay? It's not our righteousness. It's not that, oh, now I became a Christian, now I became righteous. But that's not really the right wording. Okay? Now I'm a Christian, and so God has given me his righteousness. It's still nothing that we've done. It's still his. He's just deciding to bestow his righteousness on us because of our faith in Jesus. Now, chapter 5 explains this. It's one of my favorite verses in the book of Romans. Chapter 5, verse 17. Chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace... And of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Okay, now, in the midst of this, there's a lot. Because what's going on is they're, they're kind of doing a, a comparison and a contrast at the same time of Adam and Jesus. And he's saying, when Adam came in, there was one offense that came from him that brought about death. And that death, you know, unfortunately, went to all people. There was a spiritual death that happened and spread to all human beings because of Adam. But then he says, then the other guy, which is Jesus, um, he brought about a, a gift that was um, given to all. And he says that this is um, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness that comes to us by Jesus Christ, right? So I put it in bold face because I want to make sure you guys see that up there. The gift of righteousness. Righteousness is a gift, okay? It's given by faith. But it's a gift that only can come from God. Because there's no human being that is righteous, as we saw earlier in chapter 3. So we need God to come and to cleanse us of our sins. And so then we look to Jesus and we say, well, he died for us to cleanse us of our sins. And then God says, yes, I'll give you righteousness. And so you can imagine, kind of like if you guys have ever been to a really nice hotel or, you know, a nice, I don't know, Airbnb or something like that, you know. You go in, and it's like everything's all nice, and they got little, you know, mints on the pillow, and you go in, and they have these beautiful white robes for the bathroom, you know, and it's like, oh, I've got this white robe, you know. You kind of feel like you're something important, but you're really not. You know, you're staying in someone else, someone else's room. And uh, so they get that. You can imagine just taking that, that nice white robe and wrapping it around you, and you're like, wow, look at this. I, I feel like a new person. That's the gift of righteousness. I always imagine like a robe, like, like I put it on, like, wow, I got God's righteousness. And I'm putting it on. I didn't do anything to deserve this. It's his. He's just given it to me because it's a gift that comes to me by my faith. So this is so important for us to understand. God is giving us righteousness. It is not that we've achieved anything or reached a certain level or there's nothing. We have done nothing. All we've done is believe in the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus. That's it. And then he says, I'll give you all the rest. Here it is. So this kind of leads us into that thing, you know, like we have the opportunity, and I, and I believe that all people have that opportunity, to receive that gift of forgiveness and of that righteousness that would clothe us like a robe. Um, but he's offering it out there, and we have to take it. How do you take it? You take it by faith, 
right? By faith, you say, yeah, there it is. And put it on, you know? And so God clothes you in his righteousness by the sacrifice of Jesus. Pretty cool. Okay, now, Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> he says that this is by faith, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Okay? Now, the very end of verse 22, it says, for there is no difference. And then we jump to verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this is what we were talking about last week, uh, the idea of total depravity, that we are sinners. And, you know, a couple verses to talk about this. Ecclesiastes 7.20, which we saw last week. I just think it's so good that I want to show it to you again. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7.20, it says, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Okay? Very clear. There's not a person who is righteous. No one is righteous. Okay? Now, another one I got, um, Psalm 143, verse 2. Psalm 143, verse 2, it says this, Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. Okay? This is David speaking to God, and he says, Don't, don't judge me, Father, please, um, because no one in your sight is righteous. No one. Okay? So, just goes along with everything we've been looking at. Uh, one more verse. Got another one, so I want to share with you, which is uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46. Here's what it says. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them into the enemy and take them captive to the land of the enemy, far or near, it goes on and on. Um, but basically, in the midst of this, there's that little... Uh, parentheses, and it says, for there is no one who does not sin. Okay? We understand that. We should all believe that. Right? There's no one who is perfect. There is no one who is righteous. We are all sinners. This is why we need Jesus. Because he is the only way for us to be declared righteous by him dying on the cross for our sins. Okay? So, when, God's, when Paul writes here, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it's a great verse. This is probably it's one of the most well-known verses about this topic. Um, definitely one that I've quoted many times to people. Uh, we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And that falling short of the glory is looking at his righteous standard of the Ten Commandments. Right? So we, we talked about that. You go through and you look at the Ten Commandments, each one, and we see that we don't make it. And then even when we think we do make it, well, it says, do not commit adultery. I, I've never committed adultery. I'm still good. And then Jesus goes through and says, oh, actually, if you've thought, you know, a lustful thought in your mind, then you've already committed adultery in your heart. Well, well, then we're all guilty, right? So even the ones that we think we get, Jesus raised the bar even higher to make sure that nobody would think they were righteous on their own. And, you know, that's one of the things that he even said to the rich ruler, like I think I mentioned before, that he said, all these I've done since a youth. And Jesus says, okay, all of them, okay, you've done all of them, okay. Then sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And and the guy leaves sad, right? He's like, oh, great riches. What do you mean I'm going to sell everything I have and give it to the poor? You know? And Jesus is showing him, your heart still isn't right. Even though you think that you're following all the law, you're not, right? So we're trying, Jesus is trying to level the playing field. We're all equal in this sense. We're all sinners, okay? All human beings. doesn't matter what country you're from, what language you speak, what color your skin is. What will clear your hair, your eyes are, it doesn't matter. You're, we're all sinners. Hopefully, that would unite us in the church, right? That it doesn't matter where you're from or anything. We're, hey, if you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. Come on in. Come, come receive forgiveness from Jesus. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen, but um, that's our goal as a church. And so he's establishing, hey, no one can live to the righteous standard of God. Therefore, that's why we need Jesus. Okay? So, continue on, verse 24. It says this, being freely justified, being, I'm sorry, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So here we get into this, this verb, justified. You've been justified. And that means you have been declared righteous. That's what the word means. Okay? Some people will say, uh, for some people just say, justified, if you can break it down, it means it's just as if I had never sinned. Because he's declaring you righteous. Now, then other theologians come in and they go, no, that's not right. Because it's as if you sin and you're still declared righteous. 
Um, but I think they're splitting hairs and trying to um, argue something that's not really that important. But the idea is you have been declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. And it says being justified freely. Freely. There's no cost uh, except for your heart, right? But there, there's nothing you can pay for it. There, there's nothing that you can do in order to earn it. It's free. It's a gift from God. That's why the language in Romans chapter 5 is so important, that it's the gift of righteousness. A gift is something that they give to you. You didn't buy it. You didn't earn it. They gave it to you, right? So you've been justified freely by the grace, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word redemption is very, very important. And we see this all throughout the Bible because what we see even in the Old Testament, it talks about how God is our redeemer, right? And he was the redeemer of Israel. Well, what does the word redeemed mean, or redemption? And in the forms of this word, what does it actually mean? Well, redemption means to release on a payment of a ransom. Okay? To release on the payment of a ransom. So, this is very interesting. A lot of times in the slave trade, people were brought over, especially in the United States, they were brought over from West Africa, right? And they would be brought in and they would be placed on these stages to have like sort of an auction, like, hey, who wants this guy? How much can I pay? You know, they have kind of an auction style bidding many times. And so these guys would come in and they could buy a person, they'd buy a slave. Now, in the midst of this, what could happen, and what did happen on rare occasions, is that people would actually buy a slave and then set them free. Okay, now that's a lot of money, so you have to be really rich to do something like that. That's why it wouldn't happen very often. Um, but they could actually do that. Once they purchased the person, it's their property. They're the owner. And so they can do whatever they want. And so they can treat them badly, or they can set them free. But setting them free would be redemption. Because you are buying them at a certain price and releasing them upon the payment. So this is what God did. God purchased the nation of Israel and redeemed them out of slavery in Egypt and did this amazing work through Moses and through the Red Sea, all that, all that amazing story. But then he also does the same thing with us in the New Testament. That we have been redeemed, we've been released from our bondage by the payment of Jesus Christ in order to set us free. Now the question is, what have we been set free from? Well, we're going to go through, and we're going to see a lot of this um, as we go through the book of Romans. But I'll give you a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, it's basically like what we see is we're going to see we are released from sin. We are released from the law, and we are released from death. And, and these are the three main enemies of the Christian, right? Um, or of human beings, I should say. And so God goes through, and he redeems us, he purchases us out of that, and then lets us go. I heard another story about redemption. There's several stories about redemption, but this one might be some good ones. So there was a kid who loved to make model boats, right? And so his dad had bought him this boat, and he went through, and he made this boat, and, uh, you know, puts all the decals and paints it up and all this stuff. And then he wants to go let it sail. And so he takes it down to the water and he went down. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly where it was, um, but it was somewhere where the water started to get kind of rough. And the wind started to blow. And it ended up taking away his boat and he couldn't get it. And so then he ended up losing it. And so then he was all upset. His dad said, you know, don't worry. Well, then one day they were walking and they walked by a toy store and he saw his boat in the window and it was for sale. And he said, hey, that's my boat. I mean, he had the same markings. He had painted it, right? So he knew it was his. And he, he actually went in and he got his dad to buy it. And uh, he said, now, now it's mine twice, you know? And so that's the idea of redemption. He purchased it out of that store and it becomes his in order to set it free from that window and be able to place it back. So, uh, I don't know if that helps it. Hopefully it makes it a little more clear. But this is the idea of redemption. God has redeemed us from slavery to sin, slavery to the law, slavery to death. And these were things that dominated us to the point where we lived under the fear of those things. And now God says, hey, you don't have to live in fear anymore. I, I've done something great. I've redeemed you through Jesus Christ. Right? He's redeemed us by his grace. Now, he goes on and he explains this just a little bit more. Um, oh, I have another verse on that, but that's okay. We'll skip that. Um, verse 25. He says, talking about Jesus Christ, 
Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So it says we have redemption by Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever used the word propitiation in a sentence, but it's not a word we use very often. And this instance here is kind of interesting. Because when we look at this word in the Greek, the word propitiation, it actually refers to the mercy seat, which is the covering to the Ark of the Covenants. Okay? I don't know how many of you guys, some of you guys are about my age, if you grew up, you watched Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. We just watched that uh, about a week ago. My son, he was all into it. Um, Indiana Jones is cool, right? And, and so what's he doing? He's always fighting the bad guy to save the relic, to get it into a museum so that nobody takes advantage of it. He's a good guy, right? And so what does he find? The Nazis. Man, these guys are always going after things that they shouldn't have. And they were trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, which was from the Old Testament, right? After the Babylonian captivity, we don't see the Ark of the Covenant. Actually, no, I don't know if we do. I don't think we see it when they come back. Uh, but they might have had it when they came back. Uh, but the ark goes missing. And where is the ark today? Nobody knows. Right? It's missing. Else. And so there's all these legends. Oh, it got taken down to North Africa. Oh, it's, it got taken to Babylon. Oh, and there's all these different stories. Some say it's still in Jerusalem right now. Um, and it's in a special hiding place. And they're going to pull it out when the Antichrist sets up a new uh, a temple for it. Um, but we don't know where it is. Okay? Now, what is this thing? Well, take a look with me in... Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25 is telling Moses how to build this golden box that we call the ark. Okay? That's what it is. It's basically a big golden box. So, Exodus 25, starting in verse 10, I'm going to read a lot, so follow along with me. I don't like to do that very often, but this is a good story. Uh, just describing it. It says, And they, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. So it's describing this rectangular shaped box. And it says, you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, and you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. Uh, so, basically he's describing this, this big box, gold, covered in gold, and you got the rings on either side, right? And then you put poles through, and then you have someone in the back holding it, someone in the front, maybe two in the front, two in the back. And they would lift this thing up, not touching the box, but touching the poles to carry this box around, right? And then he says, continues on, verse 16, And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you, which are the Ten Commandments. So the actual stones were placed in there. And he says, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. This is it, the mercy seat. He says, Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width. You shall make two Cherubim of gold, these are two gold angels, of a hammered work, you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherubim at one end, the other cherubim, the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. Faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give you. So he describes the mercy seat. This is the lid to the box. And it's beautiful. It's covered in gold. 
and then they have these two angels. The angels are basically bowing down with their faces down on the box, but their wings are sticking up, and their heads are right in front of each other. So they're, they're facing each other, but they're looking down, and then their wings come up, and he says, put this on top, put the testimony, the Ten Commandments in the box, and then place this on top, and he says, this is where I will meet with you, and I will speak to you on the mercy seat. So that mercy seat, that's such a strange name, but this is so important. You see, what happens is, this is where Moses went and met with God. But not only that, this is where the high priest would go in once a year on the Day of Atonement, and he would take the sacrifice that was made outside, and he would sprinkle blood upon the mercy seat, for forgiveness of sins for the entire nation of Israel in the Day of Atonement. So this is like, this is the, the ultimate holy of holies. And then what they said is they would take this, they would put it in behind this giant curtain, it was like a big tapestry, and that's where the Shekinah glory, or Shekinah, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, where the glory of God rested. So the high priest would have to cleanse himself, he would have to make a sacrifice for his own sins, and then enter in behind that curtain once a year, that's it, one time. And he would go in there. They were so scared of it, they usually would tie a rope around his feet. He had bells on his bottom of his uniform so that if something happened and he's like, hey, we haven't heard a bell ring in like two hours, they could drag him out in case he died in the presence of God. That's how powerful this is. But that place, the mercy seat, is where they would make the sacrifice. They would sprinkle the blood, and that's where God would receive the blood as a sacrifice and, and grant permission or grant forgiveness to all the nation of Israel. So this mercy seat is incredibly important. Okay? Now, what happens is, is we go through and we look at the story here in Romans. And he says that God sent forth Jesus to be a propitiation. He says that Jesus is our mercy seat. You see, that mercy seat, that lid of the box where the sacrifice is made, where God comes and meets with Moses and speaks to him, that's Jesus Christ. Because he's saying, this is how you receive a relationship with me. It has to be this way through this mercy seat. And that's the same thing with us, that Jesus is our mercy seat because he makes the ultimate sacrifice of his life shedding his blood for our sins. And at that point, when we enter in, now we can have a uh, conversation with God. We can actually approach the throne of grace because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And so now we have this opportunity to experience the Shekinah, the, the, the presence of God, in our own lives. Because prior to this, no one was allowed to go in and do that except for Moses and the high priests. That was it. They had to come in. They had to go, well, I got to sacrifice Please make my sacrifice, Lord. Please pray for me. Pray, pray to God that he would forgive me of my sins. We had to go through priests and Levites to get to God. Now, everything has changed because Jesus, as our mercy seat, receives the blood of the sacrifice, which is his own blood, and becomes the mediator between us and God. Man, so that picture of the mercy seat is a foreshadow. It's absolutely amazing. The, the, the gold, how, how precious it is, right? The, the, the cherubim bowing down at that point, right? Because all the angels are in submission to Jesus. The, the, the blood that's sprinkled on top of it is the, a picture of the blood of Jesus that he would shed on the cross for our sins. That the presence of God coming down and speaking at that moment through the, the sacrifice that's made there on the mercy seat. It's the, the, the invitation that we have to enter into a relationship with God. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. So when he uses this word, we're like, why, why do you need to use this word? Propitiation. No one knows what that means. But when you actually start to go in and study it, you're like, wow, this is deep. Propitiation means that, that we have Jesus to be our mercy seat, the place where we receive forgiveness of sin. Man, it's amazing. And it says that he sent Jesus forth to be our propitiation, our mercy seat, by his blood. By his blood. It's his blood. That was sprinkled on the mercy seat. It's his blood that was shed, right? And this is also the price that was paid for the redemption that we received in verse 24. Because he said, hey, you have redemption. Okay, we were bought at a price. We were released upon a payment. What was the payment? It was the death of Jesus. He paid the price, his own blood, 
to cover us of our sins. Okay? Now, check this out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is a verse that we all know, we should all know, um, being that we are so focused in, on taking communion every week, which I, I think is fantastic. I'm not criticizing that at all. Um, but here's what it says. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, um, we're picking up the middle passage, but it says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So this is deep because he's giving us the communion. He's giving us the elements, right? Take this cup. And what does he say? This is the cup of the new covenant not the same as the old. It's a brand new covenant, which is a sermon for another time. And he says, it's the new covenant in my blood. You see, his blood gives us the redemption. It gives us forgiveness. It washes us clean of all of our sins. But it also establishes a new agreement between us and God. We no longer live under that old agreement, which was the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. Now we have the opportunity to have a relationship with God that is grace-based based upon what he did for us, not what we can do trying to keep his righteous standard. He changes the entire system of how God relates to human beings. Again, I'll, I'll give you guys a sermon on that one day, because uh, I've got several, uh, just on that topic. But this is so important. The redemption that we have comes through the blood of Jesus. The blood is a picture of the blood that is sacrificed for us, for the, the sins of Israel, on the mercy seat, where we receive the mercy of God and we can walk in the forgiveness and the newness of life of the new covenant. Powerful, right? Okay, so he says that it's by his blood, back in the passage in verse 25, if you can go back to chapter 3, verse 25, um, it says, God sent Jesus to be a propitiation by his blood through faith. Okay, so there it is, through faith again. To demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So, this is also a huge theological debate, which we don't have time to go into. Um, but this is a big thing. He says that God is demonstrating his righteousness. It's the righteousness that he gives to us. And he says that why? Because God previously, in his forbearance, that's like his patience, um, he had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So you look at it and say, well, how, how are people in the Old Testament forgiven? There was no sacrifice of Jesus. It wasn't by the blood of lambs and goats. That's not how you got forgiveness. It was by faith. But it was by faith in an eternal God that is outside of time. And, yeah, man, we don't have time to go into this. It's so deep. Um, but if you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about how Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And you look at it and you go, wait, wait. How was Jesus slain before the foundation of the world? He Was he slain in like, it was like 32 AD, right? No, no, he was slain before the foundation of the world because God's outside of time. So they're still covered. But he had to bring Jesus to be a sacrifice at this exact moment, even though he had previously allowed sins to exist without the covering of the blood of Jesus. So he's showing his goodness by sacrificing Jesus, and then it covers all the sins that were previously committed. Uh, it's kind of a powerful thing. And then we get to the last verse, which is verse 26. And he says, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So what he said is, kind of to wrap this up, God allowed sins to go previously unpunished. There, there was no sacrifice for them. But the blood of Jesus basically covers everything that happens because Jesus is eternal. And so he says, now he allows this to happen to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. So then God shows that he is righteous, he is just, and that he is the justifier. He makes people righteous by the blood of Jesus. So it all comes down to this. God did everything for you. God did everything. Like everything. He, he, he sent you here, Right? He sent his son down to die for you when you were in rebellion against him. He died on the cross. He raised him from the dead. He gave you an opportunity. He said, hey, receive my gift. I'll give you my righteousness. I'll redeem you from all the, the death 
the, the, the sin, the law. I'll, I'll pull you out of all of that, and I'll make you a new person. I'll give you the Holy Spirit. I'll, I'll give you gifts so that you can do things. I'll prepare good works that you can walk in. He does all these things, showing his righteousness at this time through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so God, he is just, he is righteous, and he is the justifier. He's the one that makes righteous. He has done everything. And this is why it says, back up in verse 24, that it's by his grace. Again, by his grace. All of this is grace. God doing things for us that we don't deserve. We don't deserve Jesus dying on the cross. We don't deserve to be redeemed. We don't, we don't, we don't deserve to have this propitiation. We don't, we don't deserve any of these things. We deserve hellfire, right? But God says, no, no, I love you so much. I'm going to do something amazing in all of you. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to receive all of these things through Jesus Christ. And so the idea is that we finish the just go, man, he's amazing. Look how good he is. Look how, look how righteous he is. Look how powerful he is. He did everything. He's amazing. And then we turn and we praise him in response. That's it. That's all we can do. What else can we say? Thank you. I mean, does that really make the, 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 the effort to, to help God to understand what we, what we think about him? I mean, it's, thank you doesn't do it. It's not just enough, right? It's not powerful enough. And so all we can do is give our lives in praise and worship to him, right? Because God is so powerful. And so this is a short explanation of the good news of Jesus Christ. He redeemed you. He is the mercy seat. He has um, demonstrated his righteousness and given you his righteousness to gain your life. It's amazing. All right, I'm going over. Rambling here. Let's pray, and we will come back, and we'll kind of go over that a little bit next week, and then get into the last part of the chapter, which is also uh, interesting. Father, we thank you so much. For this passage, I pray that it did a good enough job to explain it. It's a lot of deep words and, and deep theology in that little section. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you would give us all enlightenment and understanding to be able to understand your scriptures. And that if there's any lack of clarity, I pray that we would be able to discuss this after the service. So um, guide us, help us to rejoice in what you've done. Help us to uh, praise you and worship you when we come in here. That, that on Sundays when we, when we get together as a body, that we praise you for all of the amazing things you've done for us in Jesus Christ. So uh, fill our hearts with your joy, with our gratitude to be able to celebrate all the good things that you've done. Help us to leave here full of you as we go back home. Guide us this week. Help us to have a great